As we pray together, preparing ourselves for the word of God, for the message of life. That the Lord himself will prepare your heart, prepare your mind, and make you have real attention. As the Lord is going to speak to us on such an important subject tonight. You open your mouth, you want to pray. That the Lord will allow the words to sink deep in your heart. And that the purpose of God for granting you the privilege tonight to listen to the word of the Lord. This purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And I'll be good. Amen. Amen. There. Open your mouth now and prepare yourself before the Lord. Pray that the Lord Himself will speak to your heart. The highway to the promised land. God taking us to the promised land. Wanting us to be there at all costs. And when they call, will come to you. To come home. Come to glory. And the Lord himself. Will help you to be prepared. To get ready. So that the call to come on high will not come to you unprepared. That the word of God will have a transforming effect in your life, changing you through and through, making you the man, the woman you ought to be, fulfilling the purpose. Of Christ coming to this world to save, to sanctify. Get you ready for the coming of the Lord. The Word of God says, Pray without ceasing. Watch and pray. Let's you fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. For the flesh is weak. Blessed, purged, purified, set free from sin, set free from sinning. For the soul that sinneth, it shall die. For the one that is set free from sin shall live, live forever. In Jesus' name we pray. And the good people of God said, Almighty God, we do thank you once again for your word. We bless your name, Lord, because here we are today, once again. Because we want to take us to the promised land in glory. Are you showing us the express way, the highway? We pray, Lord, as we show us the way, we'll take the way that leads home to glory in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, our hearts will not refuse. Our hearts will not reject. But this way you place before us will follow through. Until the end of our journey in Jesus' name. 
Speak to every heart now, to the young, to the old, to the men, to the women, to the members, to the invitees. Everyone, Lord, will hear your word in Jesus' name. And fulfill your will in the world, in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to this important subject. Heavenly citizenship. Or the subject that is. And what revelation we have in the word of God. That the ultimate goal. And the reason why Christ came. And the reason even for the creation of man. Is that God eventually will be able to have a people that will live with Him and live with Him forever. And we need to know and understand and remember that however long we spend on earth, become a Methuselah, live more than 900 years here on earth. 900 years, a thousand years is nothing in comparison with a million years, a trillion years, in comparison with millions and millions of years without end. And if there's anything we ought to be thinking about, if there's anything we ought to be reading about, anything we ought to be praying about without ceasing, it is that so that we become the citizens of heaven. Everything we do on earth is a preparation for glory. And the reason why the Lord Christ came is to prepare us and take us or bring us to glory. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Reading from verse 10. For it became him for it behooved him, for it befitted him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Do you see why Christ came? It's so that eventually it will take many sons to glory many people to glory and the people of God understood that they knew that's the reason why Christ came and it was in their heart that they will be citizens of heaven Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10 Hebrews 11 verse 10 for he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. They had cities to live on earth, but they knew that that was earthly, temporal, only of this world. And because of that, their hearts were longing, their hearts were desirous. And they were looking ahead to the time they will see the Lord and live and dwell with the Lord in eternity. They were rich on us, some of them, but they looked for a city up in glory, up on high. They were popular on earth, but even with the popularity, they said that's not enough. The popularity is going to be for a few years. They still look for a city. There are many people around them, sons, daughters, neighbors, relatives, but they said that's not enough. They still look for a city. And they had a lot of investment here in the world. But they knew whatever investment they had, whatever possession they had, whatever inheritance they had, they said that's not enough. But they still look for a city which has foundation, whose Builder and maker is God. Some of them had power and authority. Some of them had possessions. And they had some kind of servants. They could control some of them, hundreds, thousands of servants. 
But he said, all that will come to an end one day. Because of that, they were looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. But such in, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And he said, as strangers and pilgrims, you don't say to you, as if this is your final home, as if this is your eternal home, as if you're going to be here forever and ever. He said, you are just strangers. And you are a stranger here, don't you know that? You are just a pilgrim here, moving on here from where you were. And you are going on to the promised land. Verse 14, for they that say such things, declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, they desire a better country. Heaven is a better place. More glorious place than anywhere you could be here in the world. Everybody knew that. Christ knew that. That's why I said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now they desire a better country. That is an heavenly, heavenly country. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. He has prepared the city. And is going to take only prepared people there. I pray that you and I will be prepared and ready in Jesus' name. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. It's telling us that the world does not know us. Why should the world know us? After all, this is not our home. We have a heavenly home. We are known in our home. We are known in heaven. We are not known in the world here. Beloved, must you? Now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall see him. You will see him. For we shall see him, and we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. I'm sure you would have met religious people, church going people that don't care about purity. They don't purify themselves. All they think about is going to church. They don't purify themselves. They don't have the hope of heaven. All they think about is being religious. They don't purify themselves. All they think about is the opinions of people about them. And once people respect them, honor them, exalt them, flatter them, that's enough for them. That's what they're looking for. And because of that, if they have the praise of men without purity, if they can have the exaltation of men without being pure, if they can have the exaltation of men, and they can have all these accolades and applause they give unto them without being pure. All they want is just that applause. But those who have the hope of heaven, those who want to go to heaven, and those who want to live in a place of glory forever and ever, 
everyone, every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself even as he is pure. That shows the kind of person we are. If whatever you have got now, a place in the world, position in the world, a place in the church, position in the church, a name in the world, a name in the church, if that's all you need and you've got it, you'll not think it's necessary to purify yourself. You'll say, what am I purifying myself for? I have what I have always wanted. But here it says, the people that have the hope of glory, the hope of heaven, and they want to spend eternity in heaven, every man without exception, because only the pure will reach there, only the holy will reach there, only the righteous will reach there. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Heavenly citizenship will be there in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. I'm dividing the message to three parts. Number one, passion and pursuit of the heavenly city. Passion and pursuit of the heavenly city. Number two, the promise and preparation for the heavenly country. Promise and preparation for the heavenly country. Number three, Purity and perseverance. You need to persevere and deal till the very end. Hold on to the very end. Maintain the same commitment, the same consecration, the same devotion, and the same heart desire until the very end. Purity and perseverance of heavenly citizens. Number one, passion and pursuit of the heavenly city for the heavenly city we're looking at psalm 27 psalm 27 we're looking at verse 4 one thing have i desired of the lord it is the psalm of david the man had a name the man had position the man had some honor the man had some servant soldiers. The man had some wealth. He had riches. He had prosperity. He had wife. He had children. He had houses. He had palaces. But then he said, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that and that will I seek after. He said, Beyond and above. Everything I have got. This one thing. I'm seeking after. There's one thing I'm pursuing. There's one thing I'm passionate about. One thing have I desired of the Lord. You see, that's what makes the Christian life what it ought to be. Once you are derailed, once you are distracted, and you put another thing beyond this one thing, this desire to get to heaven. Maybe riches. Maybe having a husband. Maybe having a wife. Maybe having children. Maybe having a job. Maybe having a kind of title in the denomination. Becoming a reverend, a bishop, an archbishop, a priest, a father. Once you put any other thing beyond the desire of getting to heaven, it's going to affect your faithfulness and obedience to the world. You'll not be conscious of who you are, where you are, what you're doing. But David said, with all I have got, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. 
in first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19 first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19 if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable are there not people that their Christianity is only for this life? Are there not people that pray only for things of this life? Are there not people that are very, very religious and sanctimonious only because of the things of this life? Look at the millions of people in this our country, in this continent of Africa, that rush to a place of worship one day or the other. And ask, why do they go there? Why do they rush there? And look at the thousands of people that come to our church. And you need to ask the question, why do they come? What are you looking for? Is it only for the things of this world? And then when you pray, and you are praying for this, or the things of this world, how do you pray so passionately and so fervently when it comes to thinking and preaching and hearing and preparing for heaven and praying for heaven? How do you pray? If only, if in this world, in this life only, you have hope in Christ, you'll be of all men the most miserable. Because the Lord himself said in Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8 Reading from verse 36 For what shall he profit a man If he shall gain the whole world What will you do to gain something in this world Maybe you want to gain money What do you do to gain money Maybe you want to gain promotion in your place of work What do you do to gain promotion at the place of work. Maybe you ought to have a certificate. After all, that certificate is going to be useless the day you die. Or you are buried. The certificates are not going to be buried with you. Even if they are buried with you, what's the use? What's the value? What do you do to get a certificate? Maybe some people, all they want is getting a wife. What do you do to get a wife? You know, people will do anything to get a wife. But the day you die, that wife will not be buried with you. What do you do to get a husband? Anything, anything. The people that forget their souls. They forget eternity. They forget holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. They will do anything. And the word of God is saying, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? Come back to the church here. What do you do to gain the position of a pastor? The privilege of a worker. And to hold your place so that nobody will ever be able to remove you or discipline you. What do you do? To keep the place of being a worker in the church. But how useful is that? What shall he profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If there's anything well to seek. If there's anything well to run after. If there's anything well to pursue. It should be that we are ready and prepared for heaven. Paul the Apostle knew that. That's why his passion, his pursuit, was to get there eventually. In Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 21. Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. For me, to live is Christ. It says, I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking, how can I follow Christ more intimately today? How can I speak like Christ, talk like Christ, act like Christ, 
think like Christ, behave like Christ, eat like Christ, and interact like Christ, love like Christ. How can I do something today just to be more intimate with Christ? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This was not a man afraid of death. Uh, if you know religious people, in fact, the reason why many, many people go to churches or run to churches, especially churches where they pray and pray and pray, Lord. They are praying about heaven. They are praying so that you will extend your place and your life here on earth, so that they will not die, so enemies will not catch them, so sickness will not kill them. What does it matter? If you live long on earth, you live in hell, you live in wealth, but there's no salvation. For me to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not, I know not. For I mean it's strange between two. I mean a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. That's the passion. Of a real apostle. Show me an apostle today. Many people that parade themselves. I'm apostle, I'm apostle, I'm apostle. Do they have this passion to go to heaven? This desire to go to heaven? Or is it just a title? Here yeah, it says, I mean it's strange. Betwixt you. It's like there is kind of conflict here within me. I have a desire to depart. And to be with Christ, which is far better. In verse 24, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. I'm sure you know some people that they, they don't understand the scriptures. They don't understand the pursuit and the passion of a believer. And then sometimes, you know, they want to kind of deceive you with their dreams and their visions. And they say, you know, come to our church because our prophet said, you know, there is a relative. And then as he described it, I knew he was describing you. And he said that that relative is going to die. And if he doesn't come, leave his church and come to our church and we'll pray for him. And anoint him with oil and give him deliverance. He will die. You know, that's the method they use for the people who don't know that death is glory. Like going home, going to heaven. There's nothing bad in going to heaven. And the apostle said, I want you to go. I want you to go. But I'm going to stay for some time to minister unto you. Don't allow anybody to threaten you. But that thing they call death, death, death. They saw a vision. They had a dream. And somebody said, and then somebody comes to you and he says, Are you so and so? Yes, I am. Huh. Be very careful. Don't uh, go to the retreat. Don't go to a crusade. Don't go anywhere. There's some people waiting for you there. They're going to kill you. You know, this uh, kind of thing that they use in the world right now. And they use that because you don't know. They know you don't understand that you have to have the passion. And the desire of going to heaven. Jesus is there. Why would he not be there? In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm reading there from verse 10. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. Then he says, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That was his passion. That was his pursuit. A real child of God. That ought to be your passion. He says, that I may know him. And then he says, if I may, if I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I'd already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after him that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended but this one thing I do he had a passion he had a pursuit he had a desire and he wouldn't allow anything to discourage him or to turn him around and if you're a real child of God that ought to be your heart in first Corinthians chapter 9 first Corinthians chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 24 do you not that they which run in a race run all, 
but one receiveth the prize so wrong that she may obtain it says there is a prize to be reached what's that to you what you want is what you should go for are there people that will be healed from sicknesses what's that to you just for yourself are there people that will be educated not for yourself just think about yourself are there people that will be saved that will get to heaven he said unto them think about yourself and strive to enter in at the strange gate for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able when once the master of the house is risen up and a shut to the door and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying Lord Lord open unto us and ye shall answer and say unto you I know you not whence ye are Many people, what will be their response when the Lord says, I don't know you where you are coming from? Verse 26. Then shall ye begin, shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. Where was that? That was at their retreat. They had 5,000 there, not counting the men, the women, and the children. And he said, Sit down. And he sat down. And he fed them. And the only edge, the physical food, they didn't take the spiritual food and they didn't take the food that would make them to live and live with the glory of God in their lives until they got to eternity. And so they began to say, We're eating in your presence. You were there, we were there. And thou wast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me. Tell me the rest. Tell me the rest. Say that again. All ye, all, all, all. No exception. All, all. All ye workers of iniquity. God is no respecter of persons. Coming to church if you see a worker of iniquity. A worker of evil. A worker in sinning. Developing and growing in sinning, in evil, all ye workers of iniquity, then shall be weeping. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out, thrown out, cast out. And they shall come from the east, and from the west, and from the north, and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be, tell me, last, last. What does that mean? You know the new converts? How they are eager to serve the Lord. You know the new converts? How they are passionate in serving the Lord. You know the new converts? How they are on fire for the Lord. You know the new converts? How they obey the Lord promptly. And then those are the last that shall be forced. You know the old timers. You know the people that got saved many, many years ago. And it's not their first retreat. They have been coming and coming. The first and you know how cold they are. And you know how slow they are. And you know how they say, I knew that before. No pastor is going to jerk me up and stir me up and push me up and lead me on. I'm going to take my time. And when I want is when I will do it. The first that shall be last. I pray that the fire of God will burn your soul in Jesus' name. And you will not be among the first that shall be last. You can, you can be the first and can remain the first. At least Enoch remains the first. And Elijah, he remains the first. And Peter and Paul and John, they remain in the front line until they died. will remain on the front line till we die in Jesus' name. 
That's what he's going to take for us. Now we need to make preparation. Preparation, preparation. We're looking at Psalm 15 verse 1. Psalm 15. We're reading from verse 1. The preparation we're making for that heavenly country. Psalm 15 verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, that walketh righteousness, that speaketh the truth in his heart. Do you know how many people have the truth in their heart, but see another thing with their tongue? Do you know how many people know the exact thing, the absolute truth in their heart, but see another thing with their tongue? But to get to heaven and to live in heaven forever, it takes you forgetting whatever it is. If I tell the truth, what's the consequence? It takes you forgetting the consequence of telling the truth. And just go ahead and tell the truth. He that walketh uprightly, he that walketh righteousness, he that speaketh the truth in his heart, he that backbiteth not with his tongue. That's how to get to heaven. What price are you willing to pay to get to heaven? What are you willing to do to get to heaven? If backbiting has become the sweet thing that you do every day, talking about your leaders. About your overseers, no more preaching, no more evangelism, no more soul winning. All you have to talk about is just talk about that overseer, talk about his wife, spread information about their children. That's now your full time business. Backbiting. And to get to heaven, are you willing to pay that price of just allowing other people to mind their business? And you mind your own business and live your own life and say, I'm not interested in any information, information about this, about that, about brother, about sister, about that child, about their children, about their wife, about their husband. I'm not interested. All I want is to get to heaven. That's my push. That's my passion. That's my pursuit. And all this gossip here and there. Count me out of that. He that backbited not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. Nor doeth evil to his neighbor. You know the people of the world, before you hurt them, they try to hurt you first. You have not even hurt them. You have not done anything against them. But they are suspecting. Should in case he may have the intention to hurt me, let me hurt him first and paralyze him. Let me hurt him first and destroy him. Let me hurt him first and then stop his intention. A believer doesn't do that. A believer will turn the other cheek. A believer will say, What does it matter? Maybe he wants to hurt me. Who knows? Let him go ahead and do it. That's only in the world. The Lord will reward me for that in eternity. But you know the backsliders of today, they want to hurt you before you even make any attempt to do anything against them. And it says over here that he, do, he doesn't do any evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. That vile person may have money. He says, go away with your money. Who needs your money? Dirty money. A vile person is contempt. A person that is immoral, that is evil, bringing gifts unto you. Reject it. That's how to get to heaven. In whose eyes, a vile person is contempt. Condemned and rejected. But he honors them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. 
he that doeth this sin shall never be moved. That's how to get to heaven. Psalm 24. Psalm 24 verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Then he tells us very clearly in verse 4. He that has clean hands. He that has clean hands. He that has clean hands. Your hands are not sticky. To take the money that doesn't belong to you. Either in the office or in the community. The virus and the papers of the office. Your hands are not sticky. To take them without permission. And of course, you don't touch your mage. Or you don't touch and defile your daughter. If you're going to get to heaven, your hands are clean. And you don't touch another man's wife. Don't allow the sin they call the flesh to drag you to hell. One day in hell, you'll forget all the pleasure you ever had with another man's wife. Let your hands be clean. Not allowed lost immorality. Don't allow all those pleasures of the flesh. Touching other people's wives, defiling other people's wives to take you to hell. What a great price you pay for dishonoring the Lord. It says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, a holy heart, a new heart, a sanctified heart. And then it says, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. I pray God will get us ready for heaven. I said he'll get us ready for heaven. Have you noticed that kind of that kind of payment? If I said God will get us ready for healing, for deliverance, your amen will take away the rule. But then I say once again, I pray God will get us ready for heaven. You know, in the earlier years, that's what deeper lives stood for. That's what we're still standing for. We have always believed in healing, but we put healing behind holiness we have always believed it's good to be joyful and happy but we have always put happiness behind holiness not before we always made holiness to be number one if healing comes after praise the Lord if happiness comes after praise the Lord but healing will come behind Happiness will come behind. Holiness, I watch words and lifestyle. Holiness, number one. I pray God will do it for us. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the lowly in spirit. Blessed are the humble in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's how to get there. And blessed are they that mourn. When you've done wrong, when you've fallen into sin, when you've made a mistake and it's pointed to you, you mourn. You're sorry. You're sorrowful. You're not bragging of your mistake. It says, Blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. And then it says, Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. I pray you all see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Think about that. You know, it takes that to get to heaven. 
is the people of the world. If there is no fight, they look for a fight. And there are people that come to the house of God to disturb our peace. And when everything is peaceful, and the church is peaceful, and the workers are peaceful, and they're living peacefully together, or somebody says, why is everybody in agreement with the GS? Let's tell some people, instigate some people, drive some people. There's too much peace. Looks like the Prince of Peace has reigned in their midst. Why is there so much peace? Let's do something that intimidates somebody, infuriates somebody, torment somebody, scatter them. You know, those are unbelievers, those are backsliders. Doesn't matter who you are. And there's always something in your heart when everything is peaceful. The house of God should be peaceful. The habitation of God should be peaceful. Where Christ, the Prince of Peace, is ruining, there should be peace. And if it's in your own heart, in your own mind, that you don't like it when everything is quiet and restful and peaceful and just flowing together, and then you say, we must do something to jolt them, to stop them, make somebody get angry, remove the peace. That means you are not a child of God. Whatever name you are called by, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I pray that God will make us remain His own children. Did you say Amen? Did they hear that Amen? Praise the Lord. Number one, the passion, the passion and the pursuit. Number two, the promise and the preparation. Number three, now, the purity and the perseverance. The purity and the perseverance. The Lord is telling us that if we're going to get to heaven and thank God He has prepared a place for us, we want to get there. And He's giving us the high wage of that promised land the highway the highway to that promised land and it's showing us how we what we need to do and how we need to get there and it tells us except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God and if there's anything that ought to be uppermost in your heart Anything that ought to be number one in your life, it is that you'll be born again, so thoroughly born again, that you live the life of a real child of God, so that heaven, you will not miss heaven in Jesus' name. And if that is going to happen, it means then that you exalt holiness as number one, righteousness as number one, purity of heart as number one, sanctification as number one, because that is what it takes. We're looking at First John again, chapter 3. First John, chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 1. First John, chapter 3, verse 1. He will read, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Remember, those peacemakers, those who don't like fighting the church, those who do not kind, give themselves to kind of stimulating, engineering conflict in the house of God. Those are the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we, the peacemakers, we who are born again, we who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, we are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him, 
For we shall see him as he is. And every man, how many people? And every man, how many people? And every man, how many people? Every man. Doesn't matter which church you belong to. Every man, every man, every man. You know, sometimes as I move around, some people say, I am not of that denomination, I'm not of that. It doesn't matter if heaven is your goal. Doesn't matter if heaven is your passion and your pursuit. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. You know, sometimes I ask somebody, Are you sanctified? Oh, he says, Pastor, I'm not a worker. I said, What do you mean? Who oh, said, I've learned, I've heard that you saw me when you are a worker, they're going to ask you a question, When were you saved? When were you sanctified? And since I'm not a worker, am I not allowed to do jobs as I would? Since somebody is not a worker, can't she live a sinful life? A licentious life? A dirty life? An unrighteous life? No. Sanctification is not just for workers. It's for anyone and everyone that wants to get to heaven. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. What does that mean to be pure? It means to be free from sin. Verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin when he has come into your life. And has taken all the sins away. All the fornication taken away. All the adultery taken away. All the hypocrisy taken away. When he has taken all your sins away. That's purity. And then he says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him. Neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, tell me, tell me. I hope you understand that applies to everybody. There's nobody that's above the word of God. God doesn't say, well, he is so and so. He has a great position. Even though he commits sin, I'm going to kind of not apply that. Everyone is applicable to everybody. And if you're going to get to heaven, you must be free from sin. Because, don't you remember what we sang? Heaven is a holy place. Filled with glory and with grace. Sin can never enter there. All within its gates appear. From defilement kept secure. Sin can never enter there. If you hope to dwell at last. When our life on earth is past. In that home so bright and fair. You must here be cleansed from sin and have the life of Christ within. Why? Because sin can never enter there. You may live in sin here below. Heaven's grace refuse to know. But you cannot enter there. It will stop you at the gate by you forever. Out forevermore. Sin can never enter there. If you clinch unto sin until you die. When you draw your latest breath, you will sink in that despair to the regions of the lost. Thus to know and what a great awful thing. Thus to prove at awful cost that sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. So, if at the judgment bar, simple sport, your soul shall mar, you can never enter there. That's the reason the Lord is telling us that what we need to do is to be cleansed from sin. And when you are born again, that is done. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever 
is born of God. Tell me. I said your servant is born of God. What's the rest? Ah, you are afraid to say it. He that is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin. And he cannot sin. And he cannot sin. Because he is born of God. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. Verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. When somebody is born of God, is so conscious of the presence of Christ. So conscious of the power of the Holy Spirit. And is so conscious of the desire to go to heaven. And he says, uh uh, I cannot do that. I cannot go there. I cannot touch that because I want to get to heaven. And says, over here we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And then in that verse 18, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one touches him not. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He has given us already. The possibility of being holy is there. He's given us. The possibility of being pure and righteous is there. He has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Whereby he has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. That's what it takes to become holy. That's what it takes to become righteous. That's what it takes to become a member, a citizen of that heavenly city, heavenly country. That it makes us partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, for if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he that lacketh these things, he that lacketh saving faith, he that lacketh diligence, he that lacketh virtue, he that lacketh the knowledge of the things of the Lord, he that lacketh temperance, self-control, self-discipline, he that lacketh patience, perseverance, he that lacketh godliness, he that lacketh brotherly kindness and brotherly charity, love and charity, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling. Don't worry about others. Just yourself. To make your calling an election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. I pray you will not fall. I said it will not fall. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Follow peace with how many people? Tell me out loud. Follow peace with all men. John Wesley Ash a wife that was tough, difficult, wanted to get that man, preacher of holiness, away from the path of holiness. But John Wesley knew he had married, he had married. What could he do? 
a catch is experience of holiness follow peace with all men Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve wanting to get that man preacher of holiness away from the path of holiness but John Wesley knew he had married he had married what could he do he kept his experience of holiness. Follow peace with all men. Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve, the treasurer of the team. And Jesus knew him. But Jesus never forgot where he was going. Follow peace with all men. The early church had loads of problems from those religious fanatics. What could they do? Follow peace with all men. In your community, around you, there will be many people that will just say, I know his passion, I know his pursuit, I know. What he wants to do, he wants to get to heaven. If we can just make him disorganize him, disorganize her, we'll win and take him to hell with us. Don't fight. Follow peace with all men. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 follow peace with all men. And, and what? I said, and what? And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord was holiness honesty without hypocrisy are you that honest through and through are you honest in the dark honest when nobody will discover what you've done honest far away honest holy nearby holiness is honesty without hypocrisy what's holiness obedience without obstinacy obedient to the word of God without being obstinate stiff neck rigid obedience to the word of gracious obedience loving obedience obedience to the word of God that you are very conscious not to become a kind of religious fanatics. Just doing something to do it. You look at the word of God. Then you say, I want to be holy. And holiness means obedience without obstinacy. For holiness is love without lust. Holiness is love. You love and the Bible describes the love for us, not lost, not this kind of erotic and sentimental things between a man and another man's wife, a man and another man's daughter. Love without lust. That's holiness. What's holiness? Holiness is integrity without iniquity. Having integrity. And you can be counted upon no matter where you are for no reason will you be unjust for no reason will you shift the standard integrity without iniquity you don't want to do anything wrong to gain anything to say whatever it is i will gain by being unrighteous i give it up gain money gain position in prestige, great gain, flattery, and gain the praise of men. What do you want to gain? Holiness is integrity without iniquity. What's holiness? Holiness is newness without negligence. New, new heart, new life, new behavior without negligence. Because you are a new creature, that doesn't make you to neglect your duty. That doesn't make you to neglect your responsibility. 
holiness is newness of life without negligence. Was holiness endurance without enmity? Endurance without enmity. You know there are people that endure, but they have so much enmity in their heart. I will endure their pressure, but I hate them. That's not holiness. I will endure the discipline, but I hate the pastor. And when he calls me back, I will show him. I will fight back. That's not holiness. I will endure the inconvenience, but I'm going to use some wisdom. And I'm going to torment that man that is giving me that inconvenience. That's not holiness. I will endure whatever I'm going through, but... I will never pray for that man or love that man. That's not holiness. What's holiness? Endurance without enmity. What's holiness? Self-denial without self-indulgence. Self-denial without self-indulgence. That's what Jesus said. And he said, if anyone follows me, let him take up his cross. Deny himself and follow me. He said in another place, if a man follows me and he does not take up his cross, deny himself, bear his cross, he cannot be my disciple. Holiness is self-denial without self-indulgence. What's holiness? Holiness is steadfastness without stubbornness. You're not to be steadfast in evil, the stubbornness. You're not to be steadfast in rebellion. That's stubbornness. You are not to be steadfast in wrong doctrine, in false doctrine. Holiness is steadfastness in good doctrine, good behavior, good lifestyle. Holiness, steadfastness without stubbornness. And that's what the Lord said, follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Honesty without hypocrisy. Obedience without obstinacy. Love without loss. Integrity without iniquity. Newness without negligence. And endurance without enmity. Self-denial without self-indulgence. Steadfastness without stubbornness. I pray God will give it to us. I said God will give it to us. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which... No man shall see the Lord. Rise up and let us pray. We're preparing for that heavenly city. The heavenly city. The heavenly city. That's why you are here. That's why you came. We have shown you the highway to the promised land. That's why you came here. That's why you became a member of this church. Your passion. Your pursuit to be for that heavenly city. Open your mouth and tell the Lord about your passion, about your desire, about your goal, about your aspiration, about your ambition. The heavenly city. Yes, there's a place called heaven. Yes, it's the glory land. Jesus is there. The angels are there. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus told us, are there. The prophets, the faithful ones, not the false prophets, the faithful ones are there. The righteous, Enoch, Elijah, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, David. We're not sure about Solomon. Nobody is sure about Solomon. David is there. Isaiah is there. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Joel. Will you be there? Is the abode of the righteous? They do in place of the Almighty God. And the Lord is saying, Your passion, your pursuit should be for that heavenly city and your influence on other people should be to make them desire to get to heaven encouragement it should inspire others influence others encourage others 
to want to get to heaven. Passion of pursuit. Passion of pursuit. One thing have I desired. And that will I seek after all the days of my life. Tell the Lord, this will be my passion. This will be my pursuit. Heavenly city, this will be my goal. Heavenly city, don't just run to these great gatherings. I'm there, I'm always there without any passion, any pursuit, any desire, any aspiration to get to heaven. Make this your goal. Make this the number one thing in your life. And push every other thing behind. Wealth behind. Health behind. Happiness behind. Friendship behind. Marriage behind. Childbearing behind. Let get you to heaven become number one in your life, in your heart. Work behind. Position behind. Privilege in the church behind. Title in the church behind. Number one, number one, number one. The heavenly city. Bring it up purpose in your heart, in your life. That's what God wants for you. And He has promised to take you there. The Lord Jesus has gone to heaven to prepare a place for you. Won't you be there? Prepare. Those who have come before us, your husband, if your husband is gone, your wife, if your wife is gone before you, your child, if your child is gone there before you, they're waiting for you. be waiting for you. Watching. When you are coming in, prepare. Otherwise, there will be an eternal separation between you and that person you love. Prepare. Heaven is a holy place, beautiful place, Wonderful place, glorious place. Sin will never, never, never enter there. To prepare means to repent of sin. To prepare means to permanently turn away from sin. Sin of every shape and sin of every size. And sin of every description. Sin. Be free from that sin. Private. Public. Small. Great. Be free. From all sin. Sin of covetousness. The love of money. The root of all evil. Be free. Be holy, be pure, be righteous, no backbiting, no smiling to us, or your high bitterness, hatred in the heart, that's hypocrisy. Showing outward respect. When there's inward rejection, that's hypocrisy. Holiness without hypocrisy. Obedience 
without obstinacy. Obedience. Gracious obedience to the word of God. Prompt obedience to the word of God. Obedience that comes from the heart. Sincere. Obedience to the word of God. Obedience without obstinacy. Love. Love. Love without lust. Love without lust. Love from the heart without fleshly desire to commit sin. Love without lost integrity be straightforward upright sincerely good trustworthy I mean integrity without iniquity that's what it takes. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Pray that the Lord will confirm it in your life. Newness without negligence. New. New creature. New spirit. New heart. New life. New attitude, a new behavior, newness without negligence, endurance, endurance, endurance without enmity, not enduring and gritting your teeth. I said, I'll try, I'll manage, I'll endure, or I hate him. Let your endurance be without enmity. That's holiness. Self denial without self indulgence. Steadfastness. Without stubbornness, heaven, heaven, heaven. Desire to go there, make plans to go there, prepare to go there. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Heaven is a holy place filled with glory and with grace. Sin. And never enter there. All within its gates are pure. From defilement kept secure. Sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. Sin will never enter there. So, if at the judgment bar, sinful sports your soul shall mar you. And never get there. If you hope to dwell at last when your life on earth has passed, in that home so bright and so fair, you must here be cleansed from sin and have the life of Christ within, because sin 
can never enter their sin, can never enter their sin, can never enter their soul. If at the judgment bar, simple sport, a social man, you can never enter there. You may live the sin below heaven's grace on us. Heaven's grace refused to know. But you can never enter there. It will stop you at the door. Buy you out forevermore. Sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. Sin will never enter there. So, if at the judgment bar, simple sports or social man, sin can never enter there. You will never enter there if you clinch to sin till death when you draw your latest breath you will sink in dark despair to the regions of the lost thus to prove at all cost that sin can never enter their sin will never enter their sin will never enter their soul if at the judgment bar simple sports the soul shall mar you and never will never enter there father we thank you for this hour thank you for the truth of the word that has come to our hearts Lord, we pray, will take sin as the greatest enemy there is to fight. And Lord, we present every sin in every life before you. And we pray, Lord, crucify the sin. Crush the sin. Destroy the sin. Take away sin from every life in Jesus' name. Lord, when we pray that you take sickness away, you take it away. When we pray that you take infirmity away, you take it away. When we pray that you take poverty away, you have taken that away. Lord, here is the greatest enemy for the soul of man. Sin. Lord, we pray the sin in all the shape and size. The sin, wherever it's coming from. Oh Lord, I pray, wherever it is in the heart of any man, in the life of any person here, take it away in Jesus' name. I will pray that that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. That honesty without hypocrisy, give it to every one of us. Obedience without obstinacy, give it to every one of us. Love without loss, give it to every one of us. Integrity without iniquity, give it to every one of us. And that newness of life without negligence in any form, give it to every one of us. Endurance without enmity, give it to us, Lord. And we pray that self-denial without self-indulgence, give it to us, Lord. And the steadfastness in the way of the Lord without stubbornness, give it to us in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray the reason you brought us into the kingdom is to take us to heaven and to take us to glory. We pray, Lord, any hindrance on our way that will hinder us from getting to heaven, Lord, we pray, approach it today. Take it away today that that heavenly city, better country, better place, oh Lord, we will reach there in Jesus' name. And whatever the devil is trying to do to tie the rope of naughtiness and the rope of stubbornness and the rope of rebellion around us to drag anyone to hell, slap that rope, destroy that rope. And caught that rope so that you set us free to get to heaven in Jesus' name. And Lord, we know that the quality of the real child of God getting to heaven is that we'll follow peace with all men and the heart to fight against your word and the heart to fight against the servants of God and the heart to fight against the ordination of God we pray Lord that fighting spirit take it away from every life in Jesus name 
that every one, one and all will follow peace with all men. I will follow and practice and live in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Make this our watch word. Make this our lifestyle. Make this our character. Make this our behavior. Every day, every week, every month, every year for the rest of our lives. That Lord, when we close our eyes here on earth, we'll see you up in glory in Jesus' name. Affirm it, affirm it in every heart and every life. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus